All right, trust me, you're gonna, there's gonna come a day when one person's gonna sit at the front row, the other person's gonna sit at the back, and they do that for a reason. You're gonna come across a day when brother so-and-so is fighting against another brother so-and-so because his wife said this, and then their wife said that, and then their daughter did this, their son did that, and then what's gonna happen is it's gonna involve other families, and then it just turns out to be a mess. So this is very important to understand with Matthew chapter 18, which is a basic to understand how you handle controversies, disagreements, and problems within the church. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, and then we'll read verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall what? Trespass. Now, what did that verse say? It said trespass, right? And that's how you feel. How you feel is that, okay, so here's one person right here, and then here's another person right here. And then let's say that there's a conflict between them. So there's a problem. They cannot agree. Now what happens right here is that the passage says that it's a trespass. That's how you honestly feel. You honestly feel what the other person is doing is sin. That's what you're going to find out. And what you're going to find out is when you uh, go in, get involved with both parties, you're going to find out that, what, that both of them are accusing each other for sin and etc. So this is what's normal in church. All right, I'm giving you good advice. All right, it might happen one day. You never know. So the person honestly feels like it's an honest, genuine wrong to them. Okay, so the Bible, it can recognize and understand that feeling. So if it is a genuine wrong, a genuine sin, what do you do? This is what you do. Go and tell him his fault between thee and him, what? Alone. Okay? What this doesn't turn out into is that we start to do a thing called gossip. So we don't want, we don't want this thing to turn out to be a gossip or like tattling and then we go da -da 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 to other people. And then, look, I guarantee you this, okay? It always goes it always goes from a best friend or to your spouse. That's what it always goes, or to a sibling. It always runs like this. And then what it does, then it gets other people. Now, let me ask you this question, especially if it's a church of only 10 people, because it can happen in small churches. I've run very small churches before, and I'm like, wow, nearly the whole church is in trouble, okay? I've been through that kind of mess before. So the thing is this, what is this edifying where let's say that there are only one, two, three, four, five, six, there's only six people in the church and then you get them all involved in that. That's not going to be edifying. That's going to be more destructive, right? So then that's why it's very important that you do this first alone. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because it's important to understand sometimes the other person doesn't know so let's say this person doesn't know how you felt from their treatment from them. But here's another thing. If, the, if you actually approach this person, you might be surprised that there were some things you didn't know that actually hurt this person too. So that's why it's very important to talk it out first. So this is supposed to be done at a manner. Now, this is not at a point where you're preaching and rebuking each other. Like, you're in wrong, you're in sin. That's not how it should be done. The spirit that it should be done is in what? If he shall hear thee, thou hast what? Gained thy brother. The point of this whole thing is that it's supposed to reconcile with each other. The spirit that should be done is not to pound or cut or hurt so-and-so, the point is, I want to win you back in fellowship. That is how the whole spirit is done. If you don't have that kind of spirit in you, that explains why there was this problem to begin with. Because you both want to cut each other. You both don't want to reconcile. You know how uh, uh, church splits start? Church split starts with pride. Church splits start with people who want to cut the other person down not reconcile. Yeah. That is extremely important to understand. Do you know why? Because this is supposed to be a family. This is supposed to be a group where we soul win together, encourage each other, pray together. This is not a church where we go all jihad against each other. Yeah. That's not the kind of church we are. You're supposed, we're a family. We're supposed to be a team. Doesn't make sense that 
when one team is about to verse against another team in basketball, that their team members are, want to cut each other down. What does that do? That hurts the team. And that makes the real enemy, the other team, win against them. And that's why ecumenical churches grow stronger than Bible-believing churches. That's the reason why heretical churches will do better than Bible-believing churches, because they spend more time in teamwork, uniting, and then Bible believers are too busy cutting each other down, especially on YouTube and online. That is not the right spirit. All right, now look at verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, well, that's not a surprise, right? <laughs> but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee, what? One or two more, the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now notice right here that, remember I mentioned about turning to other people and then tattling, gossiping. That verse, did it say about the sin of gossip here, the sin of slander here, about tattling? No, that's not what the verse said. Besides, you're supposed to deal with them one-on-one -on -one alone first. What do you do when you get these people involved? It's noticed, it's for evidence. Evidence. It's not so that you can... Get some people to sympathize with you, and then you can build up your own team where you can cut down the other person. See, that's the wrong spirit, the wrong heart, the wrong attitude to begin with. This is simply done as for evidence. You might say, why is that? Because it is important. Why? Because it's all going to be he said, she said. See? So you need evidence for that. You need to, sometimes the other person, here's another thing. Sometimes the other person might say that your kind of thinking and viewpoint is wrong or you're misunderstanding. But then if he has several people in the church who comes up and says, well, actually, I got to let you know that you've been, it's been bothering me too, and yeah, it affected me. Then this person might get the memo and say, oh, okay, so it's not just this one individual that I'm hurting. It is the whole church that I'm hurting. See, so this is only done for evidence's sake. What does it say? That the mouth of two or three witnesses, may uh, every word may be established. See? It's done to establish. It's done for evidence. It's not done to gossip, to cut down the other person. That's important to understand. Okay, now what happens after this? Look at verse 17. And if ye shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the who? The church. Now it's going to have to affect the whole church. Why? Because this is such a bad matter that it's not going to get done. So now it has to bring the attention to the church. And then what happens? But if he neglect to hear the church, see, now the church is going to have to take sides. How can the church take sides, though? The church can take sides, see, when that's why, that's why witnesses are established first. Do you see that? Witnesses are established first so that the church, out of the public eye, can see what's going on right here. Otherwise, it's going to look ridiculous that one person is arguing against one person and the whole church hears about it. What do you think the whole church is going to do? See, it's just going to be chaos. It's going to be messed up. It's going to be confusion. It's not done. The Bible says, let all things be done in decently and in order. For God is not the author of confusion. So you have to look at the evidence at an objective standpoint. Let's keep reading right here. But if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a what? Heathen man and a publican. That's very strong. So now we know that this person, because it affects the whole church, this is really bad. So because it's really bad, now we have to treat you like you're a serious issue and then cut you down. See, you know when you cut down the person as a final last resort. Do you see anything more after that? No. That is a final last resort. A final last resort is when all the evidence is laid out and the sin affects the whole church and then you got to get the person out. Now, here's another thing right here. The Bible says that the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and the book of Proverbs that love covereth a multitude of sins. So here's the thing right here is that out of Christian love, another thing that can overcome it is Christian love. Christian love can overlook a lot of the wrongdoings that the person may have done against you. So if you can do that, you don't even have to start with Matthew 18. You notice that? So with Matthew 18, you don't even have to begin that path if you had Christian love to begin with. That's why it's very important to look at your heart and see if you have truly the right Christian love. 
So you got to look at your heart and see if you do have the honest to write Christian love to begin with. And another thing right here is that in the book of First Thess uh, Second Thessalonians, I believe, chapter 3, somewhere over there, and Romans chapter 12, you know what you're supposed to do with people who hurt you or considered to be enemy? You're still supposed to love and bless them still at the end. Wow, how about that? So you got to understand this fact is that, you know what the sign of a carnal church is? A sign of a carnal church and a spiritual baby in Christ. And if you don't believe me, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, which I'm not going to quote for time's sake, but look at that passage. You know what the sign of a baby Christian is? Division, strife. The Bible says, hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth a multitude of sin. So you see right here, where you might, confuse, where you might think, oh, I do love the brother and sister in Christ, you got to ask yourself this, is it really love or is it hatred? Because the Bible says, hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth a multitude of sin. So you got to understand that fact that we don't go on a jihad hunt against everybody, because every, you got, you got to realize this fact. Everybody in this church are imperfect people, they've got problems. The only thing that we have to put a foot down is what? We only have to put a foot down if it ruins the testimony of the whole church. Unless it's a serious thing that ruins the testimony of the whole church, then yeah, we've got to put our foot down. I mean, look, I'm not going to have a pedophile or a homosexual in this church. No matter how much love we have toward the brother or sister in Christ, that is not allowed in the church. When there's fornication going on, that is not allowed in the church. So these sins that plainly affect and hurt the testimony of the church, that's where you put your foot down. But you know, here's one thing that's interesting right here. You notice in Matthew 18 that when the person trespasses against you, you know what, it, you know what in contest it should affect in verse 17? The church. So sometimes you've got to ask yourself this question, is a person hurting you? Is that where you're focusing more on, how you feel, how you're more right about? Or is it the testimony of the church that you're thinking about? That's when you know you can put the line in. Whenever you have the context of what will help the church, what will help the church, not me, me, me. That's where strife, argument, disagreement, pride always begins with me. It's I, I, I. When you think about the church, the church, that will be a blessing to the church, help the church, edify the church, trust me, you will know when to uh, take proper action and what to say and how to behave is when you think about what edifies the church. You know what people do? They tend to go by how their flesh feels and don't think about how it would affect or hurt the church in general. When you think about how it would hurt and affect the church, you know how to control yourself and to take proper action. Why, if there is pedophilia or fornication in the church, that doesn't mean that I uh, overlook the sin. It affects the church. It does not edify the church. It really hurts the testimony of the church. I don't want a bunch of homosexuals say about our church, oh, what a great church. It allows homosexuals in. Of course not. So because of that, I know where to take action on. Not only that, when, I'm, when you compare the trespasses and everything that you hear from different people, and then you compare the evidences, when you think about how is this going to affect the church, how is this going to affect, when you keep predicting, predicting, and you keep looking at it, you will take proper right action. So notice Matthew 18, the whole context is because it affects the church in general. That's the idea. It's not all about me, me, me. It's for the church.